So welcome everybody for the, the last lecture of this kind of mini series around compiler intermediate representations. So we have looked on Tuesday kind of a little bit shallowly into functional intermediate representation yesterday in a little bit more depth into the SSA based intermediate representations. And today I want to talk a little bit more about um, what I call here domain specific uh, intermediate representations, but actually it's kind of more um, kind of a comment or, uh, or an opportunity as well to talk about a particular framework that I want to talk about today, which is called MLIR, which is a recent framework that has been developed by colleagues at uh, Google mainly. So the main person who have developed this is Chris Lettner, who has uh, been the academic of, I mean, the, I think it's part of his PhD actually, the work leading to the LLVM um, infrastructure work. And then he went to Apple for quite some years and has also there designed the Swift programming language. And since then he has left Apple, was then at Google for some time where among others he worked on this MLIR framework. And he is now working at a startup called Sci-Fi, which where they, what they do is they develop um, kind of a specialized hardware which accelerates machine learning which is very fashionable at the moment. And I think that is, uh, at least in my opinion, kind of a little bit of a glimpse what the future for us might hold. That is that we have kind of seen over a long, long, long period, like how our traditional like understanding of what like computer hardware for us looks like hasn't really changed that much. Um, up until roughly maybe 10, 12 years ago, where suddenly our processors who has gotten faster and faster and faster over 50 years, uh, didn't get like faster like gigahertz uh, or whatever comes above gigahertz, um, but instead, and the and the silicon didn't get faster because we run into real hard physical problems in making our traditional uh, general purpose computing hardware scale faster. And what people have done for the last well, yeah, 10, 15 years is they've started to to come up with this idea of of multi-core processing. So to essentially say, uh, I know how to make one computation faster, so I just plug another of these computational units onto the same silicon, and then I can do two computations at the same time. Um, and we get some performance benefits from that. Um, and that has led kind of to these multi-core CPU designs, which are now kind of omnipresent, right? And even like a, here, my, my phone here has like a multi-core CPU on it. But one other observation we can see there is that there are a lot of different other types of hardware actually on, like for example, our phones, but then also now accelerating, for example, here, machine learning uh, workloads. Um, and I think we will see much more specialized and domain-specific hardware coming up in the future. And one of the big questions for us is, what does this mean for our software, right? Does this mean we the optimization that used to be good for x86 or ARM, will they also be beneficial if I have a, a GPU-type device? Well, obviously, they won't, right? Or if I have maybe a hardware device that I can actually reconfigure at runtime, like an FPGA, well, then suddenly I have like all sorts of additional opportunities, right? And um, as part of this um, of this uh, of this trend, Google has started to develop this framework. And actually, one of the the names, the paper which is connected to this, is uh, called MLIR, a compiler infrastructure for the ends of Moore's law. And this is kind of this hardware trend that I just described where suddenly hardware becomes much more us, and so we have to also change how our compiler infrastructure look for this. Okay, so um, MLIR is not a single intermediate representation. I think the name is very confusing and poorly chosen in some sense, okay, but instead it's a compiler infrastructure, so in some sense you can think of this as a C++ framework, that allows you to define your own intermediate representation. And then the big advantage you get is you can have it interact and integrate with other intermediate representations who are also implemented in the same framework. Um, and the LLVM intermediate representation we saw yesterday is then just one instance of what in MLIR people call a dialect. So this means one specific intermediate representation 
uh, uh, kind of rep represented in this larger framework. Okay, so why did they build these these frameworks? So kind of they asked the question, and some of these pictures here are taken from a presentation from this presentation um, about MLIR from Chris Latner and uh, Tanya Scheibsmann, who, who is the project lead now at Google for this. And if we look at the Clang compiler, yesterday we talked about the LLVM MyR, right? and we also talked a little bit about or showed this in the this course that if you take a C++ program, for example, here. The Clang compiler turns this into an abstract syntax tree, which is fairly close to what the source program actually looks like. And then there's a huge gap to lower this down to these low-level LLVMIR we looked at yesterday, right? Where suddenly there's only branches flying around and all control, higher level control flow structures are gone, right? And um, like I showed a version of LLVMIR earlier in the course where suddenly uh, like the, the behavior of like throwing exceptions was embedded in this LLVMIR, right? And that means the abstractions that we have in our language uh, we want to think about, right? So something like, uh, oh, that's an exception I want to throw, gets compiled away, and it's only a bunch of branching at the at the LLVMIR level. Okay, and how you map this big AST down to this isn't obvious at all. It can take a quite confused uh, way. Okay, and that means what people actually are doing now is they have built these kind of a Clang specific control flow graph to somehow try to understand and capture a little bit more of the semantics of the programming language itself to be able to do Clang specific or C, C++ specific analyzers, which for example will tell you um, like something about the semantics, uh, like semantic properties that you get from the C language, right? So something like unreachable code or stuff uninitialized and um, and uh, any sort of, uh, of type of more sophisticated analysis that uh, might talk, for example, about, I don't know, you construct a string um, out of a like a C++ string which lives on the heap out of a out of the C string and then you you re turn this back into a C string again which happens to be a like a conversion that happens all the time in C++ code and you might want to optimize this away at the level where you actually uh, think about this like at the C++ or at the C C uh, programming language level and not down at the instruction level so in the in that presentation Chris Letner argues very much and says like we they have totally built uh, Clang or C, C++ specific intermediate representation that should sit in between this ASD and the low-level LLVMIR, which then gets lowered to object files eventually. And then these tools, they could have worked nicely on this one intermediate representation instead of now implementing this implementation and actually then starting to mimic some optimizations that might happen, like inlining and other stuff because you might want to simplify your reasoning. So you now duplicate implementation effort, stupid idea, okay? And it turns out that high-level intermediate representations are not just a good idea for a compiler like Clang, but they actually do exist for languages like Swift, Rust, Julia, Fortran, and they are called SIL, which is the Swift intermediate language, they are called Mir in Rust, or there's the Julia IR and the Fortran IR called Fear. And um, they all exist, but they're all implemented kind of outside of this. Of, I mean, they're all implemented in their own ways, right? And an idea of this MLIR framework is to say, why can't we all unify some of these in a software framework that allows us to talk about how they interact and integrate with each other? Okay. And one of the things, and that's a little bit kind of the domain specific flavor, is that besides having the these high level languages we we um, we are familiar with anyway that we have now more domain specific representations of computations so for example a tensorflow graph and then under the hood like there is like this huge compiler infrastructure project with different backends and one of the backends here is this xla backend which then can go into lvmir but it can also target domain specific stuff and like this entire thing is just like a huge uh, mess in some sense okay and actually the tensorflow which obviously is a google thing right was one of the main drivers why they have developed this mlir framework and they now allow in one pass to compile from tensorflow via the mlir uh, via the mlir uh, framework um, and dialects were implemented in it 
Okay, <clears throat> so I will give a brief tutorial, if you'd like, here around what uh, MLIR instructions look like, what, what a program looks like, and so on. Um, there's a very nice, or very nice, I mean, there's plenty of material, actually, I should say, um, on the MLIR website. So they have like this, uh, like, Quite, quite extensive list of talks um, using MLIR, different components, how that works, and they have like a tutorial and some general talks over this. And I'm going to cite a little bit out of these tutorials here. And in, uh, they have also a way where you can implement kind of your own toy language in this example, in this tutorial, um, where you essentially can then build a representation for a completely toy, toy language that you can then fairly easily compile down to to um, LLVMIR. OK, um, so what is this dialect I've been talking about? So a dialect essentially defines a custom intermediate representation, and it comprises out of three things. Um, comprises about of a set of operations, which are kind of the, well, the operations you can perform, OK? A custom type system, potentially. So you can define your own custom data types or your own custom types. And then a set of parsers, which essentially are like compiler parsers, so uh, well, they, they, which kind of operate over the intermediate representation and might try to either analyze or optimize or transform it in some, in some way. Okay. Um, so an operation in MLIR is modeled now as what they call you, or what you can think of this as an opaque function. Opaque in the sense that MLIR, so the, the framework itself, has no clue what this string, right? And it's literally a string, right? Even though you can write parsers to make this writing this stuff like easier, okay? But this is literally just uh, some token, some symbol that means something in your mind, right? And Whatever the semantic of this is, well, that's what you then implement when you might implement parsers who operate over this intermediate representation and might turn this into other instructions or other operations, I should say, or you lower into these operations. Okay. An important thing is, or important thing is, like, I mean, you can see that there are arguments that are passed into this operation, okay? And then there are return values coming out of this. And you can actually also have multiple return values coming back. And you can then deconstruct them in the MLIR and can say, like, oh, I want the first, the first return value, the second return value, and so on. And uh, there is a bunch of attributes, which are kind of side information you want to pass along that are not inputs to your to your uh, to your operation uh, and then interestingly enough if you'd like this has now a function type right so this here is a function type which essentially says uh, this operation takes some input and gives me back some output and they all have some type okay and these types here they can be uh, specific or customized to your dialect. So that means you define your own set of types that you would like to you would like to use. Okay. And that means this is now our, even though that looks horrible, we will see a little bit of more examples how you can build with this uh, representation that you that you construct. Okay. Um, one thing we looked at yesterday is we looked at SSA forms, and I should say, I should say that one of the one of the things that MLIR demands is, or specifies is that the representation that you're going to define in your dialect that has to be essentially represented in an SSA form. So that means this here is a single line, if you'd like, um, in if you think yesterday in our control flow graphs that instructions in it. Well, now in MLIR these are operations but they can come from different dialects, right? But that means the same properties we talked about yesterday, that uh, you have to define uh, these variables before they're used. So there has to be a domination relationship and you have this control flow graph you build. That is all still true for the MLIR, for the MLIR framework because it's based on the SSA, uh, on the SSA representation. Okay, so one thing which is different compared to the SSA we looked in yesterday, and that's an addition that has been made in this framework, or in this MLIR, is that you can have what they call regions, okay? So a region is 
essentially opens up a scope where you can have then uh, a list of blocks or number of blocks. And these blocks are essentially what we yesterday think of yesterday, each node in our control flow graph. Okay. And actually a region is just wrapping a control flow graph. Okay. So that means you can have enough an operation and the operation can have nested inside a control flow graph. Okay. And answer your question, what language is MLI are written in? It's a C++ um, framework that you're operating in. Maybe unfortunately, but that makes it very practical to actually also then interact, for example, with the LLVM implementation. Okay. <clears throat> so one important difference really is kind of that you can have these regions being uh, being attached to these operations. And that means I can now have nested, uh, I can now represent nested structures. So for example, I can have a dialect called affine, which is a dialect that takes um, advantage of the polyhedral compiler framework. That's like a framework that understands particularly well how you optimize kind of well-behaved nests of loops. And they have an operation they call for, which is literally a for loop, where you can just say now, when I have a for loop where k is my loop index, it runs from 0 to 10. And then here, this block here, like this, oh, sorry, I shouldn't say block, this region is essentially now a nested inside. And I can inside then have another affine for, for example. And then here they have, for example, these affine if, which has a specific condition that you can only branch on the um, on the on the loop on the loop variables, and how you branch has to be uh, an affine or linear relationship for for these loop indices, which makes this loopness particular easy to to analyze. And then, for example, this can be uh, automatically parallelized based on this on this underlying properties. And if you think about this here, right, this now looks suddenly quite different to the um, LLVM IR that we had yesterday, where we would have no way to represent this nested structure like this. But instead, what we could have maybe done is we could have had like a bunch of kind of blocks in our graph hanging around that you then refer to, but then kind of you lose kind of the nesting structure in some sense, in at least in the in the uh, in the textual representation. Okay, and that means the decision of regions is a kind of quite fundamental difference to or addition that MLIR brings. Okay, and then the other big addition I should say is that there are no fee nodes. So yesterday we talked about these fee nodes being kind of the point where control flow merges. And what they are doing in, in and this is a citation out of this paper that I briefly uh, showed into the, to the camera, okay? And they say in this, instead of using fee nodes, which used to be for merging control flow, like I'm emerging, like if you have values coming from new different passes, right? MLR uses a functional form of the SSA. And this actually cites these paper from Andrew Apple that I had shown before where the terminators, so that means when I come at the end of a block, right, they pass values into block arguments defined by the successor block. So that means suddenly if I see here a block, then this can have a bunch of arguments, okay? And if you remember that we yesterday discussed, uh, yesterday discussed this correspondence, if I can find this here, uh, here, this correspondence, of um, the control flow graphs and functions, right? As a kind of a, a functional representation based on lambda calculus. One of the intuitions given by Andrew Apple was that one of these blocks here is actually a function which takes a number of arguments. And what these fee nodes are doing is you actually kind of call these call these functions. Well, what MLIR now is doing is it associates an argument to a block. And that means when I'm going into the block, so that means with my control flow graph, I'm having an edge to the block, I will actually have to pass the argument explicitly into this, into this block, okay? So that means this is a quite different representation, which means that, uh, but it allows in some sense to, I mean, first of all, get rid of the fee nodes, uh, but then it allows, via this region and these blocks 
a quite natural representation of structured uh, of structured or nested uh, operations, like here this this loop nest. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so what does this mean now? So that means we can represent in MLIR, and this using this affine dialect I've already mentioned, we have a representation that is fairly similar to what you might write or what you would think about as um, a representation of matrix multiplication in a in a language like C, right? So we have two for loops here who uh, who uh, who iterate over the uh, the outer two, I mean the outer two dimensions of A, I mean the outer dimension of A and the outer dimension of B. And then we have a third for loop iterating over kind of the common dimension. And then inside, what you do is you say, when I'm loading a value from A using both of these, like the outermost and the innermost value, and then from B, I'm loading using the, this is the other way around. So because my B might be kind of transpose, and then I can load my value of my result matrix C, and I do here a multiplication and addition and store my result away. Okay, and that's the entire representation. And the compiler can now start to analyze this loop structure directly, and we don't have to reconstruct kind of the semantics of, oh, that meant to be a loop, but actually it was just a, a bunch of branch instructions, where potentially maybe an instruction in here, I don't know, I mean, could have thrown an exception or other stuff or something like this. And now you are allowed to encode the semantics of, or at least encode the structure more richly by essentially saying, well, this for loop has a certain semantics. So meaning this here will vary over this in my nested, in my nested structure. Um, and that means an analysis to identify information and then also optimization passes, they become much more straightforward because we actually operate on the structure and at the abstraction level that we, that we would like to operate on. Okay, so this is kind of a, a prime or a small primer into into kind of MLIR. Okay, and as I said before, there is kind of a or one of the motivations was to say let's represent something like a TensorFlow graph. So you see a neural network from the MNIST um, like handwriting handwriting recognition um, example, and on the right hand side you see the representation in MLIR, and obviously I, I acknowledge that it's a little bit like hard to read, but what you can see in here is that uh, this is in, in, in this MLIR SSA form, okay? And do have instructions like, for example, here is an instruction called MHLO, which is the name they have settled on for this, for this dialect. And you see here a dot, which is actually in this case, a matrix multiplication, because the, they've generalized the idea of a dot product over multidimensional tensors. And one interesting other bit is that you can see that the types we are now operating over, they're not just plain floats, but these things actually, so here the 10 and the 9, they actually represent uh, higher dimensional tensors who have a certain shape. And we can insist, based on these typing here, for example, that these shapes have to match up um, before we we actually start to to reason about and generate code for this or do any type of optimizations. So this is a representation that now you can turn your TensorFlow graph via the right tooling into a presentation like this. And then this is the entry point in some sense for any other type of compiler optimization, um, compiler optimization that is based on trying to optimize these, um, this, uh, this, this piece of code. Okay, <clears throat> so this was kind of for the first half today, kind of an introduction talking about um, what is MLIR as a bigger framework. And we have now this idea of having these different dialects. And I mentioned now these affine dialect where we have for loops, for example. There is the dialect uh, from the XLO here where you have stuff like a matrix multiplication represented with these dot, right, bringing its own data types. And one question you might ask is like, well, I mean, we talked about functional and imperative, right? Like, how can we represent uh, like something like lambda calculus in MLIR, which I mean seems quite obvious or at least quite straightforward based on these observations that we have made before, right? So now we we use kind of we have kind of some functional ideas have gone back into the design of this MLIR, right? But there 
still no no kind of lambda, if you'd like, right? So there's no idea of abstract functions that I can pass around or anything like this, okay? And we will look into um, a small functional array programming language um, called RISE that I'm, that is a research project that I'm uh, working on together with quite a few students and collaborators over. I'm going to explain a little bit on this, on this, this RISE language, which uses a form of, of of lambda calculus as its as its core foundation, uh, how we actually implement and represent this uh, computations like this one here at the bottom right in this in this intermediate representation in this MLIR, and then how we are going to turn parts of this computation, so for example a dot product to maybe a representation like this, and then how do we going to turn this into for loops? And then sequentially, I mean, you, I guess you can guess a little bit how you might turn the for loop with this four, uh, fi and four, into um, a bunch of, of branching instructions uh, if you ever have taken a kind of a, a compiler backend class. Okay, so this this Rise project has uh, has kind of an idea that you start with a high level program like the one here on the on the right. Okay, where we have kind of data parallel computational patterns, so something like map reduce. Okay, map reduce zip are the ones you used here to describe computations over arrays. Okay, and I'm going to write these arrays by uh, writing a dot in between the size of the array and then the, the last bit here is the, is the underlying data type. So this is an n times k array of float values, so a 2D matrix. Okay, and <clears throat> this here obviously is um, kind of ordinate. Obviously, this is a functional representation, right? Where I write my my what I write here as fun are essentially lambda abstractions. Okay, and this symbol here is reverse function application. So that means I apply the value a to the function map of, and this function is then carried. So it has kind of the the, the first function argument already given. Um. And this here represents matrix multiply. So where I'm just saying I for every row of A, for every transposed, so every column of B, I'm going to combine the row of A pairwise with the column of B, going to multiply every pair, and then going to add up all the elements in between. That here is what the dot product actually is, and that here just makes it work on, on two matrices, which makes it matrix multiply. And in our implementation, what we what we what we do in our uh, in our kind of academic implementation, which is not an MLIR, we take this stuff and then we apply a bunch of uh, kind of these rewrite rules that we have seen on Tuesday to this uh, to this representation to change this functional representation another functional representation, which encodes now implementation choices more explicitly to it. That's what you call here the low-level program, and then we generate optimized code from this, okay? And that's what this RISE program is about, or this RISE project is about. Um, but today we are going to look how to represent programs like this in this MLIR framework, okay? So what is what is required to get RISE and MLIR working? So we need some form of representing lambda calculus, Okay, and then we're going to talk about how we're going to represent these data parallel patterns, so something like map zip reduce. Okay, and what we have implemented is we have basically for representing lambda calculus, we need to somehow talk about our own types. Okay, so there's this function type in MLIR for the operations, but to have more flexibility for our side, we want to actually be able to talk about um, our own functions in some sense. So something that we create like these, like these, like these lambda abstractions. So we have our own function type, essentially just says, well, this is my input type, and then this is the arrow here, and this is the, the output type that we, that we have. We have our own multidimensional data types. So for example, this is a kind of the same array type that we have seen before, where I have a float and then I have two dimensions, two dimensional and two dimensional array. So they're essentially a matrix. And then we need our two basic ideas of lambda calculus, which is abstraction and application. And we essentially just now introduce two operations in the MLIR framework where we say well, we have this lambda, this rise.lambda, where essentially I'm now uh, taking inputs. So for example, here the inputs A and B. And then I produce an output, and I have a nested uh, region 
in uh, in that con in that in that sense what, what I introduced before from MLIR, where um, essentially I have nested inside the body of my of my function, and then at some point I have a return which just returns the value. Okay, and that means in some sense what these lambda abstraction here is doing it's just barely taking a single region which has a single block inside, which has these block arguments that I was talking about before. And it just says, well, I take this and I associate this with one of my own function types, okay? And that's all that our rise lambda really does, okay? And then how we treat it when we, uh, when we uh, do optimization passes or analyze passes over this, well, that's essentially up to us, right? But this is now just, our way to write what I'd written here as fun, whatever before, now I can write lambda and can nest this here inside, okay? And then once I have my own functions, so I have like values here, such as these add, which have these function type, I can, uh, I need to somehow be able to apply, right, to call the, the, the value for it, sorry. And this is what these rise apply does. Or takes something of function type, and then the runtime value arguments, and then you get back. And this represents now zip, in this case, applied to these two arguments. Or if I would have here add and give it two arguments, then this would represent the function application of these two arguments to the function add. OK, there has been a question asking, can our rise lambda capture free variables? OK. so. Based on the nesting structure, okay, we can naturally refer to all uh, MLIR values that are in scope, if that is what you mean by capturing. Um, so that means I can represent something which is equivalent to what we have here, where inside of this lambda, I can refer to a row which is outside in, in scope, okay? And I think this is sometimes refer as capturing. One important restriction that in for our kind of small functional language we put in place is we can never return a function from another function. So we can never uh, actually have kind of the problem where you have captured a variable and you, you kind of, that escapes is closed. Or how you put it, we don't support any closures, okay? But, Obviously, you could think about how would you uh, support this by uh, essentially when you start to do uh, transformations and analyzations or when you, when you uh, start to operate over this, then you would have to think about oh, how do I actually construct a closure which, uh, which, which does these type of organizations, right? Can I take a function as an argument? Uh, yes, I can. So, and for example, you can see here that the, you can think of the map obviously as a, as a function itself, which we will see. And you can see that this here is a function. I'm not sure if I got all the parentheses right, but that what I'm passing in as the first argument, that's a function and that's perfectly fine, okay? But I cannot return a function because, I mean, at least that's the, maybe it's over restrictive, but we don't need this for our, for our system, and that prevents us from, from needing closures as a representation. Okay? So that's just the trade off we make for our kind of simple language, if that makes sense for everybody. Okay. Um, so this means, like, with these two core, um, core operations, and essentially this one type, we represent the basic form of what you can need for representing lambda calculus, right? Um, and if we now want to represent patterns, okay, I'll talk here about the zip pattern, which we have seen before, right? Then in our formal system on paper, we write the zip as the zip has for us the following type, okay? So we write here these array types, right? Where we say like, oh, I have a, a data type S and a data type T, and I turn essentially two arrays, one of S, one of T, into an array of pairs, okay? And in our implementation, we also keep track of the size of these arrays as part of our type. That's at least what how we would like to think about our uh, our our functional program, okay? And how we've captured and implemented this 
so this function type on paper in our setup is that we say we have a new operation we call rise.zip. And we are passing, when we create this, we are passing along the type parameters as part of these and these uh, these uh, hash sign here makes them what are called um, uh, what are called attributes and the in some sense you can think of this as we instantiate all of the type parameters like and we insist that you have to do this when you construct these 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 rise dot zip uh, value okay and what we get back now is a function that had this has the appropriate type for the concrete uh, type like type values if you'd like that that we have passed in for n s and t okay that means in some sense you can think of this as we don't support a polymorphic zip okay but you have to all pass the precise type arguments so that this percentage zip is monomorphic okay so it has a concrete type and no type variables in it that's the current implementation we have okay and then when we pass this to the rise apply we then pass the runtime value or the value parameters along so in this case here this would be the a row and the b call if i take this from our example before um so this is how we represent our patterns okay so where we essentially ensure this is monomorphic and then we can just we can just apply this uh, going through okay and that means that if i take something like our matrix multiply what we had before we now represent this in this nested structure you can see here right hand side okay where and i will walk you through this we have down here and now this is kind of again there's like it's a functional program so you have to kind of read it from the back to the top so we compute our result by applying the applying the outer map which is the map mapping over the a which is one of these rise dot map sec uh, which is given the precise, uh, like the, the type parameters to, to make the type monomorphic. And then we are giving it here the function as its first argument, which comes back to one of these options. Can we pass a function as an, as an argument? Yes, we can. Here we do this. Okay. And this is the F1, which is defined up here as one of our lambdas. So that corresponds to this function bit here. And we pass now in here, we have now a single row of the matrix A, which is the second argument of our, of our map. Okay, so the, the A here is a two-dimensional thing, right? And the A row is just a one-dimensional row. And then we are going to turn this into, um, into a 1D row again. And then the map will, will, I mean, because we apply this to every row, we will get back the result here will be a 2D, a 2D array again. Okay, and now nested inside of this, the green box, we have now a map which refers to another function, which is that dark green, sorry, which is this bit here, which has these other colored boxes inside. And in here, we can now see our zip, uh, our yeah, our zip map reviews, uh, which built up essentially our uh, our dot product or our matrix multiply if you take it as a whole. Okay, so that means our nice three-liner comes into this massive 41-liner. Hooray, progress, right? We need like 10 times more, more space to write it. But the advantage we get from this is that we actually have a chance now to interact and integrate with other dialects, okay? And one small detail I want to point out here as well is that one way we how we interact and integrate with other dialects, for example, is that we actually don't care what these scalar operations really are or really do. So that means what we do is we have this rise embed, which essentially allows us to take one of our values, which has one of our types, so something like these rise scalar F32, and we will then um, make this available inside of this region with actually the underlying type. So you can think of this rise embed as like, you embed the code that is in here directly into the surrounding bit and make it work with our types. Okay, so with our, our type word. And that means that we don't define the multiplication or addition operator, but this is just the set operators that are actually provided in the MLIR standard dialect, which then can naturally be lowered into LLVM 
instructions later on. Okay, so this is how we represent metrics multiply. Is it like macro embedding in C++ or is it type checked? Ah, okay, so important bits, which I haven't talked about when I talked about MLIR is, so every single operation has, uh, has types associated with it, right? And when you construct these intermediate representations, you essentially provide, uh, you write, as part of your implementation, what is what they call a verifier, which essentially is checking consistency of the things you are building up. And one of the first things you have to build up is you have to actually make these types to be compatible. Otherwise, you can't construct um, construct these uh, construct the these values. Okay, so that means there's a built-in hooked mechanism where you can uh, where you can uh, verify that your IR makes uh, makes sense. Okay, uh, there's a question on Slack. Is there any salient difference from Futa to Rise other than Futa compiles to the GPU instead? Okay, so uh, yeah, there are quite a bit of differences. So one comment is that Rise also can compile to the GPU. Um, but I think there is a difference in spirit that what Futa tries to achieve is they try to be a functional GPU programming language. And I think they do a very good job of being this. And I think the RISE work we are doing, we are kind of more thinking of being an, an compiler intermediate representation where we enable this rewriting, like optimizations by rewriting as kind of um, a principled way in some sense to a better way, hopefully, to uh, to optimize programs. So I think they use similar technologies. I think FUTAG is really user-facing, write your program to, to, to write it on the GPU. And we are much more, kind of, we are a compiler intermediate representation. And we want to take advantage of the semantics that these uh, data parallel patterns uh, the capture, and then we apply transformation rules to this uh, in hope to optimize our programs. Um, okay, so let me briefly talk about, I can see I have like 50 minutes, so I will briefly talk about some, some kind of end-to-end -end compilation story here, okay? So that means one of the things we can now do in our implementation is we can take a TensorFlow model, like the MNIST model I had before. This gets represented in these HLO dialect um, that we have seen before as well. We can then lower instructions that we support and we can kind of capture their semantics easily in our functional world, um, can look for them, can replace these by embedding our own MLIR um, like functional dialect that we have seen. And then we can either do optimizations on this, which we haven't really implemented so far many, but then we can also take this and we can say, well, the structure you have seen before, we can turn this into a lower, even lower dialect, like for the one which has um, a bunch of, of loops in it, like we saw before, which can then be lowered into a version of LLVMIR which is implemented inside of MLIR, and then that gets translated to the actual MLIR, compiled and executed away, okay? And um, how do we how do we go about doing this? So here on the left-hand side, you see, um, you see that we have uh, this MNIST with the HLO dialect, and what we can do is we can essentially just check and see, oh, do I find somewhere a dot? Yes, then let's turn this into this equivalent function, function representation, obviously in the MLIR form that I've shown before. Okay. And, um, and then we want to take this and compile this down all the way into something, for example, like these for loop based, based structure. Okay. There's been one question of saying like, is the key benefit of MLIR that you can mix and match dialects and their associate optimizations? So I think this is really one of the key interesting opportunities that MLIR opens up, where if you have an idea how you want to represent your domain-specific optimization, and if you do this outside currently of this framework, you then have a really hard time to efficiently integrate or effectively integrate uh, into, into, for example, lowering this into LLVMIR or taking advantage of, the, of this compiler representation. So it gives a really nice way to just say, but I can now build an end compiler um, 
that goes through our functional representation and that doesn't have to kind of leave kind of the C++ world and go up to Scala, where, for example, we have implemented our Rise dialect before and then does some stuff there and then goes back into C, but I can actually integrate this in a more, more or less sane way into each other. I think that's a big advantage, okay? Um, right, so on the left, we have the metrics multiply representation that I've already shown before. Okay, now the question is, well, how do we actually turn this into kind of the for loops we had seen before, right? So where you have like two for loops nested or three for loops nested, you have your multiplication addition operation, right? And we have kind of some intuition that, well, there was the multiplication addition also in here. I guess that should somehow go here. And then there was this map. And this map, I guess they should be responsible for these for loops. And there is like a reduction in here, um, here with the, uh, where do I find my reduce? Uh, sorry, here, my reduce. This, I guess, would be this for loop, right? So there's some intuition we have, but how do we actually turn this left to the right? So and that comes back to uh, some work we had done before actually talking about MLIR with colleagues from Strathclyde and Edinburgh, in particular Bob Atke and Sam Lindley and Christoph, um, where we looked into how can we take this functional representation we have and put this down to low-level code like, I mean, here this shows an OCL code, but this goes exactly the same way for, um, for the non-parallel code I'm going to show you. Okay, and the key idea there is that we are breaking up this compilation process in two steps. The first one where we turn the functional representation into an imperative representation, but in that imperative representation, we are not yet going to resolve all the index computations that we are going to do. And that is what we're then going to do in a second step, where suddenly we have like these uh, maybe slightly complicated chains of functions who influence how I'm going to access, uh, access memory. And then we're going to actually turn this into, into kind of dereferencing of pointers and index computations, okay? And that means for our bit here, we are taking, as I said, the left-hand side, and I've now indicated here on the right-hand side by color, what part actually goes where, right? And in that paper that I've shown before, there's a large uh, or there's a, a detailed description of how we are compiling down the map function, for example, in, in a formal system where, by the way, we are using continuation parsing style as our, our way to kind of pass information uh, around. Um, or around what, like, how we are going to turn the function into the imperative proof, okay? And I'm happy to share a link for this paper if people are interested for this paper uh, describing this, this process, okay? So after this process is finished, <clears throat> we have turned this functional pro, sorry, this purely functional program in some sense into this imperative program, okay, where we have now four loops and um, and assignments and so on. But we have all of these additional kind of unresolved bits hanging around, which we call here code gen, okay, who uh, essentially describe how we are actually going to access the memory locations we are interested in. And one interesting observation you can see, for example, is that the maps and the reduces, they are gone, right? So this, this purple here suggests that they have become the for loops, and the yellow suggests that this for loop has been turned, the reduce has been turned into this for loop. But the green zip, for example, that actually sticks around. And that is because zip is a pattern for us that actually only influences how we are going to access and which which memory uh, we're actually going to access, where the and reducers, they actually do the computation and not just influence how another pattern would actually then generate the code, okay? And as I said, like more details are in that, in that, in that paper describing this, the spirit. And then in the second stage, we are then operating over this uh, representation which has kind of a mixture and has not yet resolved all of these indexing into this into this higher dimensional bits. And we are then iterating essentially over these instructions to turn, to remove all of these cogen intermediate bits and to also remove with this 
all notions of our own data types. And instead, we are turning this all into this program, which only has the F and for loops, the underlying memory data types that are in this in this dialect. And we end up with exactly the code that we would that we would like to produce when we write this actually as a human. Okay. Um, yeah, and then what, what remains to be saying is like it, it actually works. So there is like an implementation of this that my uh, PhD student Martin is working on quite heavily. Okay. And um, there is um, like this is part of the, maybe I shouldn't show the pull request immediately, but there is um, this uh, implementation of our RISE language where we have this MLIR, um, MLIR project that Martin has worked. And we have in here uh, essentially now a representation of our of our dialect, um, which essentially means it's just it's an addition to this um, to this uh, to this framework, um, where we can represent exactly these type of examples that I've shown you. And you can see that there are other types of dialects. One of them is our dialect. And in here, um, we, for example, define um, in a slightly, oh sorry, in a in a slightly weirder way, using a lot of the internals of this framework. But one of the things you can see is that we define here is we define types like our function type, and we define our lambda operation and our apply operation, and then we define uh, all of our uh, patterns like the map um, or the reduce and so on and so forth. Okay, so that means this is an implementation that actually works. And that means if you, on Martin's machine, check out everything at the right, you compile a MLIR, LLVM, TensorFlow, a runtime system, and so on and so forth, then you, uh, you can actually take these MNIST uh, example that we have seen before and compile this via the parts that I've shown, and it actually executes it and, and does the right thing. Okay, one more question, like what this weird language I'm showing here uh, actually is. So as I said before, this entire framework is implemented in uh, in C++. Okay, so that means there's a lot of C++ classes and they inherit from dialects and you overload certain interfaces and so on. But one important aspect that they are using is they're using a weird macro processor called TableGen which is these .td extension to define essentially um, to define essentially these operations and data types. And that means the code you see here gets expanded into well-behaved C++ classes in a macro processing step. And uh, I don't think nobody is really happy with this table gen, uh, with this table gen language or approach. It's very ad hoc. But it seems to work kind of well enough that nobody is willing to replace it with something better. And uh, for that, we define, for example, here in a very like weird ML function, like I mean, using let and other stuff, right? This will be expanded in uh, in an appropriate C++ class, which inherits from this rise op, and then implements a certain number of of functions uh, in a particular way. Okay, so that is like one of the internal interfaces that you actually have to get get used to. Um, okay, and I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to show today. They, I'm happy to share um, more details, um, more detailed, uh, more detailed resources, including I'm happy to share a link to this table gen stuff, the how our compilation process actually works and also to a couple of uh, presentations that Martin has been uh, given. Um, there is a very long and detailed discussion of an hour-long um, presentation that Martin has been given at the MLIR design meeting, where we go through this compilation process in much greater detail, explaining how that works. So if you don't want to read a paper, uh, but want to watch a video for a little bit longer, that, that is also <laughs> available. Okay, and I think that's everything I wanted to say today. So I'm happy to take a number of more questions around MLIR, RISE, or own research work, or any other thing you would like to, to, to ask about. Yes, please. Uh, I'm interested in, is, um, is this a pure language that you're describing? So the, yeah, so the RISE language is pure, yes, absolutely. 
Um, okay. Yeah. So I was wondering, how do you handle when to clone arrays, or if like when they are shared, you can't mutate them in place, so you have to come up with a solution for that. Yeah. So uh, absolutely. So um, in some sense, like what I've 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 been a little bit imprecise, so I've kind of left a few parts out in that I've not spoken about these rewriting and kind of the difference between what I mean with a high level and a low level program. Okay, so what I'm showing here is a high level program where some of the choices you are talking about um, hasn't been made yet. Okay, so that means, for example, you could decide to introduce a temporary after you do this map multiplication here, so this pairwise multiplication. You could even think that you might introduce a temporary after you have like created the the pairs of like a value of a and like i mean a, a row of a and a, a column of b okay um but in the representation that i've then actually shown you in mlir here these decisions have already been made okay and what do i mean by this okay so i mean that uh, we have a different set of patterns that talk about either they are high level and that means we don't know how to generate code for them or to to, to lower them into something like the for loops or the, the LLVM IR. Um, but what we do know maybe is that we can apply uh, rewrite rules to them to make these decisions by, cho by choosing a particular rewrite rule over another one. Okay, so that means you might want to say, oh, I'm turning this high level map into uh, a sequential map, which corresponds to, oh, I should turn this into a sequential for loop. But we might also decide to say, well, what I would do instead is I will turn this into a parallel for loop, or I will do a kind of split my loop into or my map into like a, a set of other patterns, and then I have to decide for each of these other patterns how I'm going to lower them down. Okay, and actually in this representation I've shown you here, we have decided to perform first the multiplication of all elements pairwise, and then we are going to reduce them up. And if, if I would have actually lowered this, this would have resulted in a different low-level code than I've shown here, with an additional for loop doing first the multiplication and then a for loop doing the addition. And the program I show you here on the left-hand side, for example, that has already fused this map, these map and reduce together as explained by one of our transformation rules, by one of our rewrite rules. Okay. So, and what I've what I've essentially in this presentation have not talked about is um, what, uh, how to encode these transformation rules, um, how to choose which rules to apply, okay, and uh, how to potentially influence this process. And that's now kind of uh, the, the the last plug for my own research I'm going to do is. For there's a paper at the upcoming ICFP 2020, which is now less than two weeks away, where we talk in this paper with a number of my students uh, about exactly or at least some part of these questions. Okay, and here what we do is we introduce another language, which actually you can precisely describe and, in, and describe how you would like to turn this high-level program. Which doesn't have the question, the, the decisions you were asking for made into a low level program where we have made a precise choice about what we would like to put in memory, what we would like to parallelize, what we would like to vectorize, for example, or this type of, of decisions. Okay. So if you're interested, watch out for uh, the talk that uh, Bastian will be giving at, at ICFP for this. And I'm also happy to add this, uh, this kind of to the reference list, this, this paper. Okay. Yeah, so I was specifically looking for well, when you do mutations in place, that is in a functional yeah. language, not always allowed because you might be updating something that is used later, yeah. and that would be uh, observable essentially. It would be a side effect. Yeah. So you have to disallow that somehow, and that is you use those those patterns for that. Yes. So um, uh, we 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 do in some sense. So I mean, um, so you might have. Um, a pattern like, for example, you might have a pattern like iterate, which is a, a pattern we have designed where you apply function iteratively multiple times. And that pattern allows, when you implement it, to actually do a form of double buffering, for example, where you override 
the not the last result, but the result from kind of two iterations ago. Okay, and um, if you want to, and if you implement this um, at the high level, essentially the iterator doesn't say how it's compiled, right? But then when you when you compile this down to the imperative world, this paper here, the strategy preserving paper that I mentioned before, that introduces um, an interesting language which we call DPIA or Data Parallel Idealized Algol, okay, which is the language that Bob has designed. And this language combines functional and imperative um, elements together, where we essentially allow to uh, to keep our kind of to keep this type of question sane by having a type system that very closely distinguishes between what is where are you allowed to write and who is allowed to write where to um, to prevent these type of uh, these type of, of problems when we actually compile down from the function to the imperative. So there are a little bit more information about how we do this in in this paper. Okay, cool. Thanks. Sure. Thanks for the question. Uh, I think there's another question. Yes, please, Hossein. Hi. Uh, so thank, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, it actually was very, very interesting to me. Um, uh, and I, I was wondering, uh, well, first of all, I, I, I would be interested in having a link uh, to this paper that you're showing right now. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. that, that, please. And then the other thing is that is is the the rice syntax itself settled down? Um, well, um, so we have you mean the in the MLIR or you mean the uh, this one I've shown here before? Uh, this one. That yeah, the the, the the latter. Yeah. So this one here. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean. I'm not so much on syntax. Our, our, the implementation we mainly work on for a, kind of a little bit research-oriented questions is uh, implemented in Scala, and we essentially implemented this as a Scala domain-specific language. Uh, so we don't really, and that kind of emphasizes in some sense, as I said before, the this is for me an intermediate re representation, and I'm more interested in the structure than I'm interested in making this super nice and slick to use for a, for a programmer to express for themselves. But I'm open for suggestions you might have for improving the syntax. So maybe you want to make your point or ask a question. Yeah. Um, so the point was that if you're not, um, if, if there is no one right syntax, and there is the possibility that different users want to have, for example, different pieces of syntax for, for the same kind of problem, then you're going to get into the realm of, of um, language variation. And I think I have, um, I mean, I have a few papers which, which do touch on that. Mm -hmm. and I think I, I, can, I can latch into that and I can, I can uh, give you yet more um, degree of freedom. And I'm not quite sure whether that's what you want, but just, just wanted to say that this is available. Uh, I would be very interested. Maybe you can share this for everyone who is listening as well on the, uh, on the Slack. And I'm very interested to, to, to have a look at that. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, sure I, I will do. Cool. Um, are there more questions? around this um i i have to add that that all mm -hmm. of the developments are in c plus plus my development so <laughs> they're, they're <laughs> nice, nice as, as, as you have seen like a lot of the i mean all of the rise like developments are also in c plus plus um and yeah i mean i think i'm i'm generally interested uh particular if you do have a practical implementation because uh, on that comment of syntax right we um Particular when when we present this to kind of more systems or compiler communities, they tend to struggle with um, functional syntax and functional notation, um, and kind of abstracting over this and telling them, look, it's just like I mean, data flowish like or something like this, uh, actually can make a huge difference, 
that, and I think that for that reason, I I think uh, I would be interested in 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 having uh, a little bit more insight if you if you have it.